Okay, so today's topic, patterns, melodies, and rudiments. Uh, this is the second book uh, available, uh, the second book that I published here. This one is kind of sort of about fills, and the first one's definitely about grooves, but a lot of this stuff you can apply to grooves as well as fills. So all of the parts of this book that I'm going to cover today, they've got full-length longer videos available on YouTube and Instagram. You can watch more detailed examples and just different examples. But I kind of wanted to do a one time all the way through the whole series just to show everybody how this stuff all ties together. Give people who haven't seen any of these videos yet kind of an overview of what the second book is about. So let's get started. Uh, this is uh, not a set order. You don't have to start with patterns or melodies or rudiments. It all flows back and forth. They all overlap into each other. It's all intertwined. This is just the order I went with because I think it's easier for beginners. So we're going to start with patterns. This is the original copy of the book. Used to call it String Theory, but decided to go with a more boring title. So patterns starts with this which you guys will find familiar. These are advanced syncopation sets. Uh, what we do with advanced syncopation sets is voice them. So let me show you what I mean by that. Syncopation is a book by Ted Reed. You can find it online. I talk about that a lot as well. Um, the first lesson we're going to do is based off of the patterns found in the beginning of Ted Reed's book, Syncopation. I take those patterns and I bump up the subdivisions. So his book ends at 16th notes. I start at 16th notes. Well, I start at 8th note triplets technically because uh, there's no combination of them in that book. So our first of these, uh, one, two, three, four, yeah, four of these is triplets through 16th notes. Then we've got 16th note triplets through 16th notes. Then we've got 32nd notes through 16th note triplets. Then we've got 32nd note triplets through 32nd notes. So let me just play through what all those subdivisions are really quickly. So 16th note uh, triplets through 16th notes is triplet 2 e and a 3 e and a 4 e and a triplet 2 e and a 3 e and a 4 e and a triplet 2 e and a. That's just number one. You know, number 14 is like triplet 2 e and a triplet 4 e and a. We're not going to play the whole set today. There's, it takes a long time. But that's just an example. Okay, let's bump up the, the subdivision. We've got 16th note triplets through 16th note. So. Number 14 is... up the subdivision we've got uh, 30 second notes going through 16th note triplets so number 14 would be all right last one 32nd note triplets through 32nd notes. That's 12 notes per quarter note. Number 14. So on, so forth. That is just what we start with. Those are our grids. So if you can't even play those, you need to just get them down, hit them on a pad. But I'm going to assume that you guys can play all those, and we're going to go to what I call the voicing system. Next page here. So the voicing system is different ways to voice those grids. The first way we can voice them is by moving voices every quarter note. So if you're a beginner and you just have a standard drum set, you're probably going to have like 
one Tom here, two here, and one here. So what I start beginners with is every quarter note you change hand or you change drums. So let's go back to lesson 13. That's uh, eighth note triplets through 16th notes. And we'll just do number one. That's triple it, two E and a three E and a four E and a. So if I had two toms here, it would be triple it, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. So every quarter note, you change drums. I could do it something like this. I could go like triple it, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. Doesn't matter. Maybe that's what I'll do. Okay. So, uh, Sticking, sometimes you're going to have to change around. A lot of this stuff you're going to need to change sticking. But let me just run through like number one through four with quarter note voicings. Okay? One, T, ta, two, E, and a, here we go. And number two. There you go. So again, my voice is changing every quarter note. What's staying the same is this pattern. This grid is set. What we're changing is the voicing. So let's bump up the subdivision here really quick just to show you what it's like. Let's do 16th note triplets through 16th notes. So one, two, three, four. Okay. So that's first way of voicing. The second way of voicing, very similar. Now we voice in eighth notes. So that means something like 16th note triplets would get split up between two drums. So we're going to go triplet, triplet. And then you can set everything else to just one voice. So let's do triplet, triplet. That 16th note triplet is split up. Now everything else is going to be on this drum. So we've got. Make sense? Let's do it with number 14. That one sounds a little bit better. So. Number 15 would be. So on, so forth. All right, next would be 16th notes uh, voicing, meaning you split it up by 16th notes or whatever small subdivision you want. So if I were to say split up my voices, let's just split up four 16th notes between four voices. So one, two, three, four. One E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. So let's do triplets on my snare and then all of my 16th notes are going to be split up like that. Okay, number one would be triple it. Uh, I need to start with the left hand. Triple it. So triple it. Number two. Makes sense, right? Okay, so next we add voices, okay, or we substitute voices. The next level up, this would be the fourth way of voicing. Now we substitute one note for a kick. So if we were to substitute kick, uh, 16th notes for a kick, that would sound like this, right? So we've got. So let's go back to same lesson triple the two E and a three E and a four E and a. Number two. Number 
so on. Uh, next, you substitute two kicks. And then we go to the last three, which are probably my favorite. Groove voicings, which would be playing everything on the hi-hat with a snare backbeat. So again. Next would be, what is it? Groove fills, micro fills. Okay, so everything, uh, whatever our A that's moving through the grid now is going to be a tom or a fill, everything else is going to be a groove. So for example, if our A is triple it, and then our groove will be, so we've got one, two, number one, here we go. Then our last one is groove fills. This one's a little bit trickier. It kind of takes some time to figure out what's going on. But basically what it is, is it's a fill with a backbeat inside of it. So we would start with something like, you know, it could just be 16th notes. Might need to tune this, sorry. Didn't do a little tuning before my video. I'll throw this on here. So if we've got, let's say this is our, our fill. Now we want to put a snare on two and four. So, or whatever. So, okay, so this is a fill that is also a groove. A groove fill, we call it. Then you permutate, so. Number one, so on, so forth. All right, so here's what I'll do. I'll play number one and then number 14 from the first page of this book with all of the voicing systems. Okay, number one, quarter note voicings, eighth note voicings, 16th note voicings, kick substitutions, groove voicings, micro fills, groove fills. See if I can get through all that without making a mistake. All right, number one, triple at two E and a quarter notes. Here we go. Eighth note voicings. We're going to do. All right. One, two, number one. Here we go. And. Number 14. Sixteenth note voicings. Let's go. One, two, number one. Here we go. And number fourteen. One kick substitution. We're going to go. Number one, here we go. And. Fourteen. You can use your
your imagination for two kick substitutions. Let's go straight to grooves. Number one, two, here we go, and... Fourteen. Let's go straight to microfills. Groove fills. And let's go. Yeah. There you go. Really, really quick, really, really rough run through of what this is. The actual process of playing this, there's a ton of exercises you get from that. I just wanted to show you guys what all the variations are. Uh, let's move on to the next section. Oh, also, the book has written out examples of everything. So quarter notes, eighth notes, grooves, all that. Let's move it on. Okay, the next section, melodies. This I can't really take much credit for this section. It's just sort of a retelling of somebody else's method called the Alan Dawson method. Uh, he's a jazz drum set instructor from Berkeley. Um, he had this big uh, philosophy about reading melodies on the drum kit and then what's called fill-in exercises. So I'm going to go really, really quickly over what this method is. So... Uh, what a melody means is just like a simple rhythm and the easiest rhythm to start with would be something like one and two, three and four. Okay, so let's just play that on our crash cymbal. So what Alan Dawson would have his students do then is fill in stuff, usually with the left hand. And he was playing jazz, so it would be something like... And they would fill in with triplets. I start with even subdivisions because this is modern drumming. So we would start with uh, So if you don't understand what's going on, our melody is here. And every free note we have, we fill in with our left hand. So we bring our right hand over for those ones. Doesn't have to be on the ride cymbal. Could be on the hi hat. Could be on the floor tom. Could split it up. The important thing is that I'm not thinking about my fill in notes, they're just automatic. And the subdivision with them doesn't have to be 16th notes. It could be faster. It could be. Right? And the sticking doesn't have to be alternate or doubles. It could be paradiddles. What matters is that you're focusing on a melody. Alan Dawson, I think, would have his students sing the melody too. So, like, you know, dot, 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 Doesn't matter. Anything you want to do to help you focus on that melody. And this is a big, there's there's a distinction between this and playing patterns, where patterns, everything's kind of even, right? If I'm doing like. There's not really like a melody inside of that. It's all just one flat thing. It's just sticking. This is different. This is one note is my lead instrument, and the other notes, the other instruments are filling in. So that's the most important thing that's going on. That's the part that I want the audience to focus on. What's going on over here is just filling space. This takes a lot of beginners a while to pick up, but once you do it, you kind of, 
it's like you unlock a new sort of level of musicality in your playing. So uh, again, I did, oh, so Alan Dawson would do these exercises out of uh, syncopation. That's the book that he would have students read out of. This guy. So this book is great. It's awesome. It's got a bunch of really good solos that you can play with eighth note rests. The problem is, is that this book doesn't have any 16th note rests. So I went ahead and made a bunch of exercises with 16th note rests. Because 16th notes are funky, right? You know, it's cool to be like... That's fine, but it's even funkier to be like... Sixteenth notes are like, they're sharper, right? They're crisper. So here's a really quick example of, let's say we're going to move E's, which is the second note of sixteenth notes. One, and uh, we're going to do some exercises with E's playing our melody on the hi-hat. So let's say our first melody is going to be uh, one, E, two, E, four. One E and a two E and a here we go and one two three four. one two three four. make sense. Uh, you can do any melodies you want. This works really good in your jazz or your fusion context if you've got like a. There's maybe a section of hits. This is a really good way to approach it. Or if you've got a drum solo and there's, you know, hits, again, this is a really good way to approach it. It's going to lock you in and it's going to make you sound more musical as opposed to just, you know, patterns. Cool. All right. Let's move it on to the last section of the book. Rudiments. So... Man, there's so much stuff on rudiments out there. It's it's kind of intimidating to even talk about them because, like, what do I know? There's a bunch of other great teachers out there who know stuff about rudiments. So in writing about them, I was trying to find a way to approach rudiments that hadn't really been approached yet. You know, there's lots of great books about, you know, how to play uh, rudimental solos and how to play rudiment grooves, but nobody just said, what is the most systematic way to learn how to integrate rudiments into your playing. So took permutation studies, permutation sets, and I just run them through rudiments. The first example is double stroke rolls. So let's just take a double stroke roll. Right, right, left, left. Okay, now what I do is I up the amount of voices that we play it on. So we're starting with one voice. Let's add a second voice. It's going to be our hi-hat. I would probably not start here. I would probably start with a rack tom, but I'm not really doing rack toms right now. So use your imagination that this is a, a rack tom. All right, so we're going to take one note and permutate that note through our double stroke roll. So right, right, left, left. We're going to add one note on the first of those. So right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. And we're going to move it one subdivision over. This is a grid, a.k.a. a permuta permutation set. So we start on one. Now we're going to move that note. Here we go. Let's move it again. One more time. Okay, so you'll notice this does some things that you kind of don't very often do on the kit, which is sweeps. I'm sweeping my hand from here to here. That's pretty common sense. You've got gravity on your side because I'm going down. What doesn't make sense to a lot of people 
<laughs> because it's really hard, is going from here to here. Or even worse with your left hand. It's easy to go down. Not easy to go up. And that's the point. The point is you don't want to just fall into default fill habits. You don't want to always play your paradiddles like, you know. You don't want to always play your double strokes like. You want to be able to come up with new ideas. The way to do that is by doing things that you think aren't regular or right or correct. Doing quote unquote wrong things in a systematic way will start to add new, de new depth to what you think you can do on the kit. So let's keep going. Now we're going to have two notes on a different voice. So we're going to go, not hard. Then those two notes move to beats two and three. So now we've got. So, so on and so forth. Then they go to the last two. Then they overlap, beat one and beat four. So let me run through that cycle. Up. Tricky. Let's do that again. You're going to start to notice if you're a stiff player, this stuff is going to be weird doing these moves. And that's the point. You want your arms to flow. You want... You want to be leading into stuff, and you're really going to know if you're leading into stuff when you have to do moves like this, or if you're stiff, oh, that's not going to be fun. Let's do it with, uh, oh, you, you, you get the idea. Then you would have three here, and then you'd maybe do, oh, it's fun when you do like one and one, like flip that backwards. So you've got, it's kind of silly, but whatever, you know, not everything's going to be like the most cool musical thing. Some stuff's just going to be kind of interesting, fun ways to like body mechanics. Okay. That's two voices. Let's go to three voices. So we're going to add our floor tom as our third voice. Sorry if that's out of tune. <laughs> it sounds pretty out of tune. Uh, so the way that we do this, the way that I like to do this, is I say uh, you've got a bed of two notes and you send, of two voices, and you send one voice through that. So we would have this as our bed, for example. Then we're going to send this through it. So number one would be... Then we move it to beat two. That would be. Number three would be. Number four would be. So this stuff doesn't really feel very alien to me anymore. So I actually kind of like something like that. That's just, it flows nicely. Once you get that flow, who's really good at this is Steve Smith. If you watch him playing, he's really just got his flow down. Everything's like, it's it's very smooth and very like dancer-like almost. And that's sort of the place you want to be with this. That's more the goal. You know, it gives you good voicing ideas, good fill ideas, but it also just helps you work on flowing around the kit, you know. That's a big leap. You probably wouldn't think that up on your own. This will force you to think that up. 
All right, let's go to four voices. Now, let's add this guy. Get this into the sweeping range here. All right, so four voices. You could do, uh, you could have a bed and then uh, send two voices through it. What I think is better is to do pair reversals. So we've got two pairs. I'm going down because that's the easiest to start with. Right, right, left, left. One, two, three, four. First thing you do, flip one of those pairs. Flip it the other direction. So we were doing... Let's flip this pair backwards. Now we've got... Now we flip this pair backwards. So we've got... Then we flip this pair backwards again. And our set is complete. So I'll run through that whole thing. One E and a two E and a... Flip. 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 Just really great, really great for just doing, like, who would ever think to... Everything about it feels alien, which is why I love it. Because I would never do something like that on my own. I'm moving away and out like this. It's so, it's so alien and it's so bizarre and it's great. It forces you to get out of your comfort zone. If you're a really stiff player or if you've got trouble with a weak hand, this is going to highlight it right away. So that's just double stroke rolls. We go through not all the all the rudiments. It goes through a lot of rudiments. Uh, paradiddles, uh, six stroke rolls, uh, flams, and Swiss triplets. I even do like hertas, and uh, I think I don't think I do bluestas. Um, I think I do cheeses. What is that? That's a uh, maybe. Is that a cheese or is a cheese? I can't remember. I, I get it all confused. It's in the book. But that's it. Okay. That's just how you voice these things. You probably would never play this. Probably not gonna. It gets a little less applicable. But a lot of the earlier stuff, like... You can integrate that stuff into grooves that you're playing. So, like... Let's try it. It's so cheesy. It's not supposed to work at four, but this part works. Makes sense? All right. Last thing about this, about how this system, this book, this kind of way of approaching not just fills, but sort of less specifically hi-hat, backbeat, groove-focused stuff, patterns, melodies, and rudiments is what I call it, all of it goes into each other. So you can do a pattern exercise with rudiments. You could do a melodic exercise with rudiments. You could do a rudiment exercise based around melodies. You could do a pattern exercise based around melodies. They're not split up. They all flow into each other. And if you're not careful, sometimes you can kind of lose track of what you're doing. Am I playing a melody right now? Am I playing a pattern right now? Or am I playing a rudiment right now? Maybe you're playing all three. For the sake of expressing yourself on the instrument, you don't need any divisions between these. I'm not playing in a gig and being like, next, Phil, I'm going to play a pattern. Next, Phil, I'm going to play a melody. I mean, maybe. Sometimes I might do that, but very rarely. Usually I just kind of do whatever I feel like doing. 
But when you're practicing, this is a super helpful way to organize your stuff because maybe you're so stuck in playing patterns and you never play a melodic idea. Or maybe all you've done is jazz study so far and you have no idea how to do any sort of patterny chops type stuff. Or maybe you're really rudimental and you can't stop thinking in rudiments, right? Or maybe all your rudiments are always voiced the same way. Whatever your particular situation might be, using a system like this will help to put you in uncomfortable positions that you would otherwise not get to on your own, which is exactly where you need to be if you're going to progress and get better. If everything you're practicing is easy, you're not practicing correctly. Okay, so uh, to review, I think I kind of did review. So if uh, you guys are interested in this book, there's uh, full-length playthroughs of each section, uh, pattern section, melody section, and rudiment section. That's on the YouTube channel. They're all labeled. Um, if you guys are interested in getting this book, you can get it on thedrummerbrain.com slash store. There are digital downloads of it as well as physical copies. I would probably get the physical copy. It's pretty long. I think it's about 100 pages, so it'll give you a lot to work with. I think everything's on sale right now, too, so if you head over there, you can get yourself a discount on this. Uh, as we move forward, I definitely will be playing uh, a lot of different exercises from this book, uh, but I won't go into as much detail about how the things work because... You know, people want to get to the playing. So, uh, but this will definitely pop up again in our playing. So, I think that's going to do it for today. Thanks for everybody for sticking around. If you guys have any questions, uh, you can email me. Especially if you guys have any questions about this stuff. This is this is a huge amount of stuff. If you guys have any questions about how to integrate this stuff, or if you've bought the book and you're like, I'm kind of stuck. I don't know how to do this, or I'm not, it's not clicking for you. Just shoot me a DM on Instagram. Shoot me an email at thedrummerbrain.com, uh, uh, thedrummerbrain at gmail.com. And on that, I will leave you guys and I'll see you on Monday for hands. Thanks, everybody. Happy drums to you.